This episode contains discussion of child abduction and brief mention of child sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. On a warm Friday evening in June in the small town of Alma, Arkansas, six-year-old Morgan Nick left the bleachers of a Little League baseball game to go catch fireflies with her friends. Her mother watched as she ran into the parking lot and played. Less than half an hour later, Morgan was gone. Two witnesses, ages 8 and 10, saw Morgan stop to get sand out of her shoes while a man in a red truck watched. She hasn't been seen since. What happened to Morgan Nick and where is she now? Mm. I know we say this every time. This is going to be a heavy one. Um, it's just going to be really heavy. It's a child case. Uh, we do know that many of you skip over the child ones, and we understand if you need to do that this time, because this is a tough one for sure. No. No, I won't go. Um, we do want to thank some listeners who requested the case. Uh, thanks to Courtney, Brittany Rice, Amanda, and Haley Evans. Thank you so much for requesting it. And of course, we'd like to thank Madison for writing it up. Yes, thank you so much. Um, all right, I guess we can just jump right on into it, eh? I think we're going to have to. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh, also just to let you know, there is a Netflix, was it Netflix? It was Hulu. It was Hulu, okay. A Hulu docuseries on this case uh, called Still Missing Morgan, and it just recently came out. It's very new. Um, we're recording this in March of 2023 but it's it came out in the last month or so i think um so just to let you know there's a lot more information there it's a four part so Mm -hmm. you can get if you want a deep dive you can definitely go there um morgan's parents take part in it her uh sister takes part in it um you see her brother but he's not uh uh-huh yeah a lot of people from the police department and the investigation things like that so it's a it's a good resource to have as well morgan Chantel nick was born on september 12 1988 to colleen and john nick she was the first child to the couple she was actually born in europe when colleen went into labor she and john went to the nearby military hospital but were turned away because they didn't have enough room for newborns mm. Seems like you would, I don't know, maybe you can't make room. Maybe it was close enough, but like, can you imagine? Like, I'm about to have a child. You're going to tell me to go somewhere else. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so they went to the city's hospital where their nurse only spoke one word of English. And the only word she knew was push. That's a good word to know if you're a labor and delivery nurse, I guess. Um, not long after the doctor arrived, Colleen gave birth to a baby girl. Both Colleen and John were shocked when the doctor told them they had a daughter. They were expecting a little boy, so they had to kind of change gears a little bit. In 1993, the Knicks, now with Morgan and her younger brother, Logan, they left the military. They moved back to the U.S. to the town of Ozark in Arkansas. Their families were both in Arkansas, and after 10 years in the military, they wanted to be back near their family. Mm Mm-hmm. Not long after came the second Nick daughter, Taryn, and Morgan was super excited to be a big sister um, again, but especially now to have a little sister. So Colleen at this point is a mother of three, and she's wanting to spend as much time as she can with her children, so she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, So she ended up starting a licensed daycare inside their home because they needed both incomes, right? So like, what do you do? Um, So she started a daycare in their home that was able to supplement their income while her husband worked, but then she could be home with her kids. So for a while, she watched children of all ages, and she would sometimes do like multiple days or overnights. Um, But in 1995, she decided, okay, we're just going to do the daycare during the day. I'm not going to offer the overnight stuff anymore. I want to be able to have more time with just my kids, you know. That's a busy, busy schedule to do overnights with you know like other kids you would think that they're the kids are spending all day with her probably and then into the night and that's i don't know that's a lot yeah imagine like i mean that kind of gives a whole other thing to you know like working from home and feeling like 
you're always on the clock, you know, because like technically mm-hmm. you are, you're keeping kids overnight. Like, yeah, that is a lot. Um, Morgan was friendly. She loved helping her mother with the other children. She loved doing crafts and playing games. And she was a little bit shy, but she was also really silly and she loved making people laugh. Once Morgan got to know someone, they got to see more of her personality. So she was kind of quiet at first. And the more she got to know you, that personality would really come out. And even though she was just learning to read, she did her best to read bedtime stories to Logan. Oh my gosh, she's six. My heart. In some ways, she was uh, like most little girls her age. She loved the color pink. She loved chewing bubble gum and arts and crafts. When Morgan was in the first grade, she brought home a permission slip for her mom so she could sign her up for the track team. And she comes home after her first practice and she's like, I want to quit track. And her mom is like, why? And she tells the story in the docuseries. It's so funny. But she's like, do you know what they make you do in track? And she's like, what? And she's like, you have to run and sweat and like you know because she's sick she doesn't know what track is so it's so funny she's like do you know they make you run in (laughs) track like oh my gosh so she was like i'm absolutely not doing that morgan did not run she did not sweat those were those were not her ministry so (laughs) she was like all right i'm done with track so she decided to go the girl scouts route because she said they stayed inside and glued stuff and that was much more her speed so funny um she was also an animal lover she loved cats in particular one day colleen and john took her to the local humane society to look at kittens and colleen said morgan looks around and immediately singles out what she called was the scrawniest kitten there and was like that's my cat that's the one and she would not change her mind for anything um they said morgan was stubborn but in a fiercely compassionate way And they had to wait over the weekend to finalize everything to bring this kitten home. And Morgan worried all weekend somebody else was going to take her kitten. Um, But fortunately, on Monday after work, John brought home the same scrawny little kitten that she had claimed that day. And she was super excited. They brought her home and she named that little kitten Emily. I wonder if it's... Well, I had a best friend in the first grade, I think who was a really big dog lover, but it it seems pretty common. Of course, you got your horse girls, which, hello. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also, I was very into cats whenever I was a kid, too. Like, I had a stuffed cat. My friend and I would play cats. We would yep. get a little bowl with milk in it, and we would drink from the saucer. It's like, I don't know why, but we why, did yeah. that a lot. Why yes. do we do what we do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, That's hi, funny. we're kittens. We just w- yeah. crawl around meowing and everything. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but that's Yeah, Jesse do. does that sometimes. He pretends to be a dog, and so he'll just be on the floor, like, crawling around. He'll be like, roof, roof. And I'm like, oh, hey, Jess. And he's like, I'm a dog. I- no, I'm a dog. I'm like, oh, hi, puppy. He's like, roof, roof. Like, he'll only rough at me. It's funny. <laughs> yes. I remember doing that. And also, like, just crawling up to stuff and just rubbing on it like yeah you know, like, <laughs> yeah because i'm cat really taking on that persona yeah. i'm a method actor for sure exactly yes um i still have the litter box too so that just comes in handy it's very very useful okay i think the point of that story was to relate to morgan but also to avoid talking about what's coming next because it's just so yeah. so sad but yeah we must persevere. So Friday, June 9th, 1995 started like most weekdays for the Nick family. Just six months before this, though, Colleen, which in the docuseries, a lot of people called her Colleen. And I was like, how's it spelled? Yeah, they did call her Colleen, didn't they? They sure did Colleen. Did John call her Colleen? John did, yeah. She hmm. never pronounced her own name, so I don't know how she prefers it to right. be pronounced, but they said Colleen. Um, you would think her husband would pronounce it correctly. You would think so. So I'm going to say Colleen. I don't know if that's how she prefers it to be pronounced, but it's spelled Colleen. So, yeah. Okay. So six months prior to June 9th, Colleen and John had gotten a divorce, but they were still able to care for their children and maintain a good relationship. Colleen and the three kids woke up. They ate breakfast. They waited for the daycare children to arrive. And as usual, Colleen had crafts and activities and games planned. 
As the day ended, the daycare children went home around 5 p.m. Colleen gave the kids a bath, made grilled cheeses for dinner for her and her kids. I am craving a grilled cheese sandwich now. Colleen recalled that Morgan asked for a second grilled cheese that night, but they had plans after, so they really didn't have time to for her to sit down and finish another grilled cheese sandwich, so it didn't happen. Yeah. In the in the docu-series, this really bothers her. It eats at her still. Yeah. Well, and she said Morgan wasn't a really big eater. No, she she thought she really didn't need a second mm-hmm. one anyway. Yeah. It was unusual for her to have asked for a second one, but they were, you know, trying to get out the door. And I think just knowing what happened after that, she's abducted. I hear parents say stuff like, all I can think about is, are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they scared? Right. And I think she... Oh, Torella, no. I knew I was going to do this, but... I didn't think it would happen this soon. This is what got me. Her thinking about, like, I don't know if she ate that night and I should have given her that second grilled cheese. Like, it's just so sad. That is so sad. You're going to make me Sorry. cry, I swear. No. I mean, you got to get it out and you, you got feelings, you know, and. Yeah. So, I don't know. So it's sad. just those little things that you just, gosh, and this is just such a, like, how did it happen? It's so sad, but. I know, watching anyway. that docu-series last night, I was watching it, and I, anger is an easier emotion for me to feel than sadness. Yeah. I would much rather, like, scream and shout than cry. So I was fired up and mad as hell, and I was like, every kid, every kid, every one of them deserves to grow up. Yep. It's not yeah. fair. hmm You know, and... There's just some things that are completely out of your control, and it's just so sad. It is so sad. Because she did everything. I don't know. We'll talk about it. But. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's like we're getting ahead of ourselves, but there's so much to say. And ugh. Okay, so a family friend invited Colleen to a Little League game in Alma, which was about 30 miles away. The friend's child played on the team, and Logan, who was three, and Taryn, who was one at the time, they were too young to take to the game, so Colleen dropped them off at her mother's house, and she and Morgan drove to the game in Alma. This was a makeup game because the last one had been rained out, and they parked in the upper lot at the Alma Little League field and found Colleen's friends in the bleachers. There was a double fence all the way around the ball field and two sets of bleachers. So one on the first baseline and then one on the third baseline. There were no concession stands, no bathrooms. This is tiny. I mean, a very, very small ball field. Morgan sat on the bleachers with her mom watching the game. There were children all around the field and parking lots playing. They were running around. Morgan watched them, but she stayed on the bleachers and a small group of kids would come up run up and ask Morgan if she wanted to play, but she told them that she wanted to stay with her mom. Morgan kept, uh, this was really sweet. It's such a, it, I know that Morgan was six. I know that. But hearing things like she kept untying Colleen's shoe and then Colleen had to be like, "Ah, how did that happen? And she would just giggle and giggle and giggle. And um, yeah, yeah, those things really drive home just how young Morgan was. Yeah. Um. So just as the game was getting close to ending, two children, eight-year-old Jessica and 10-year-old Ty, ran back over to ask again um, if Morgan wanted to come and play and catch fireflies or lightning bugs, that's what we call them. Morgan looked at her mom and asked if she could go, and this was the first time she actually wanted to go with her friends. Colleen told her no, that it was too late, it was dark. Morgan, like many other six-year-olds, begged her mother to let her go play. Colleen started thinking about all the times that she had been told before that she was too overprotective as a parent, and people told her she needed to let the kids have some space. I would like to know who told her that. Her kids are six, three, and one. Yeah. They need to have space. It's not like she has a 16-year-old who is going to be doing things on their own, you know? Like, you really need to give your kids some space. These are very young children. I know. What space are we supposed to be giving them? Like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. And this, of course, is something I'm sure that has eaten at her, unfortunately, because and how many we've covered cases before? Where it was like, is the first time I let them, yep, ride their bike to school. 
it was the first time that I, you know yep yeah my hu- yeah my husband like we live close our kids don't go to the school now they go to a different school but we live close to a school and we moved in this neighborhood andrew would be like oh yeah the the boys can just when they start school they can just walk to school no the fuck they cannot no, oh no, no. no they cannot he's like it's right there I'm like oh, i know it- where it is of course, as a kid, we've talked about it before, but as a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, like, why can't I do stuff by myself? Like, you know, you want to be big mm-hmm. and you want to, yeah. yeah. and now like, I'm like, yeah, mom God. wouldn't let us play in the front yard mm-hmm. unless she was out there. And I thought, we're in the yard. What's the big deal? Mm-hmm. My kids do not go in the front yard without me. Absolutely not. Well, like, it, I think it would, it, I don't know if it would have been different for her, but if we had a house that was set off further from the road, maybe, but right. our house is, yeah it's pretty close so yeah Yeah. and ours is too yeah yeah it's just like yeah i don't know it's just those little things yeah that you think as a kid like oh my gosh get over it yeah like like and then you hear stuff like that the one the first time Mm -hmm. you know and she had that feeling of like no i i'd really rather you didn't and i don't know i think there are just so many ways as like women as moms as whatever that we're told to ignore our intuition so that we make other people more comfortable. Mm-hmm. You should smile more. You sh- you know, like when you think about, you know, people who see somebody kind of, you know, like a man acting suspiciously or they seem suspicious and it's like, well, I didn't want to be rude. So I talked to him or I got into his car because I didn't want to make him mad. We covered a case where a woman got into a man's car because he was making her feel guilty for not getting in his car. He was like, what? I'm just trying to give you a ride. And then he tried to kill her. Mm -hmm. Like, she survived it, but he tried to kill her. And it's just like we're kind of told, you know, to squash that intuition. And you shouldn't have to. It's not your it's not your responsibility to make somebody else feel comfortable. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Friends around the bleachers said that the area was safe, that the kids had already been playing there all night. And Colleen later said that she had a feeling that something wasn't right, but she figured she was just being overprotective. And of course, I'm sure the friends that she had talked to did not help with that. They're like, oh, making a big deal of nothing, not that big of a deal. But finally, Colleen relented and told Morgan she could go play. And Morgan was so excited. She hugged her mom, she kissed her on the cheek. She climbed out of the stands with Jessica and Ty, and Colleen watched as the three kids ran out. They went between two gates, and they were playing in front of the cars in the parking lot, and Colleen could see her daughter. She was wearing a green Girl Scout t-shirt. The parking lot overlooked the ball field, and the kids were playing in sand piles in the back (laughs) area. Kids will find a damn sand pile, won't they? Yes. They're like, really? Do you gotta play sand? Do we? I lived for a sand pile. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Um, and at the time I had a cat named Regis Philbin and, um, he would play in the sand pile with me. Probably crapped all in it too, but I, we, we played a lot in the sand pile. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Colleen could see Morgan and her friends at this point. She looked up three or four times over the next 10 minutes and saw the three in the same place each time. Not long after the ball game ended and Colleen began making her way to the parking lot. She saw Jessica and she saw Ty walking back towards the field, but she did not see Morgan. The two told her that Morgan had stopped and leaned on her mom's car to empty the sand out of her sneakers. Colleen walked to her car, but still did not see Morgan. She continued looking around the parking lot. She was, of course, growing even more worried as the crowd thinned out and she still did not see Morgan. She knew her daughter was shy and she wouldn't have wandered off alone. Colleen alerted the other adults and her friends that Morgan was missing, but no one could locate her. At 11.07 p.m., a call came into the Alma Police Department reporting that there was a missing child at the Little League ball field off Walnut Street. Police immediately responded and started checking the area. Sergeant Harris was the first on the scene and quickly got as much information as he could from Colleen. He found that Colleen had first noticed her daughter missing around 10.40 p.m. At first, she just assumed that she might have been walking around looking for her, but, you know, couldn't find her and then Colleen knew something was really wrong initially police just knew they had a missing child they did not necessarily know it was an abducted child at this point they believed that Morgan was just lost the public was already helping search and although unorganized they were continuously reporting back to the police 
Police started putting out descriptions of Morgan and what she was last seen wearing, as well as the information that they had gathered. More police flooded the area and started ringing doorbells of houses in the area looking for anyone who might have seen anything suspicious or any signs of Morgan. It wasn't easy to search this area because, you know, the the game that they had gone to was a rescheduled game because it had rained so much. And because of that rain, it was there was a ton of flooding in the area. Um, and they really didn't know where which direction to search for her. Nobody saw her leave. Everybody essentially was just looking everywhere. Police had gathered at, uh, that the last place Morgan had been seen was on the hilltop parking lot overlooking the field. The area was covered in soda cans, cigarette butts, and other small pieces of trash. Police quickly got in touch with Jessica and Ty's parents so they could find out what they'd seen, since it seemed as though they were the last people to see Morgan. They both said that after playing on the sand piles, the three started to head back to the field. Morgan stopped by her mom's car to empty the sand out of her shoes, like I said. Ty stayed back with her as Jessica ran ahead, and then Ty said that as Morgan was finishing tying her shoes, he took off as well, and he thought that Morgan was behind him. Both described seeing a white male with a scruffy beard and shorts who was either shirtless or had a shirt on but it was open with chest hair. He was sitting in the driver's seat of a red truck with a white camper that didn't fit on the back. The door of the driver's seat was open and he was smoking a cigarette and this man and his vehicle were right by where Morgan had stopped. So the day following Morgan's disappearance, Ty and Jessica were brought to the police station to help a sketch artist make a composite drawing of the man they saw. Police were trying to identify everyone who'd been at the field that day, but they still couldn't figure out who the man was or whose red truck it was. Morgan's parents were quickly cleared of any involvement, but that did not stop the public from, from condemning John Nick on their own. So there were a lot of reports made to police saying that John wasn't really involved with his children. He didn't really care. According big, to who? Yeah. And a big part of that was apparently because John didn't talk to the media as much as Colleen did. Colleen. But that's what I said. You said Colleen. I said Colleen. All right. But he was like, she was the one in front of the camera, typically pleading for Morgan's return. Um, and they said that John was either like just standing by her, not speaking, or he wasn't in front of the camera at all. Um, and he says, you know, what, what everybody didn't see is I'm completely cooperating with the investigation. I never denied them access to anything. And he said that in the beginning, when he did try to talk to a member of the press trying to get a statement or whatever, this person said to him directly, nobody cares about what the dad has to say. Everybody wants to hear from the mom. What is your problem? You insensitive asshole. Who? Why? Who would say something like that in the midst of the worst moment of someone's life? They're like, we don't want to hear from you. Mm hmm. His child is missing. Right. And what is that supposed to say to him? I mean, I can imagine for sure, Miss KB, I would do it, too. I'd be like, fine. It. I'm not going to talk to y'all anymore. Yep, exactly. Um, so he's like, fine, talk to her then if that's who you want to talk to. And initially, Colleen said she wasn't really on board with getting in front of the media all that much either. But she kind of realized, okay, we can actually utilize this as a really powerful tool to try to find Morgan. Um, and John to this day says he doesn't care what people say about him, about his involvement or his non-involvement, whatever. If they're talking about him, then they're still talking about Morgan and that's all that matters to him. That really upset me. Why Not, do you do something like that to somebody? I mean... I don't know. It's, I guess, I don't want to say it's human nature, but it feels like it's human nature to tear somebody apart and I don't get it. I don't get it why. Is. And you know who I feel really guilty about with that. I've never gone online and like posted stuff about it or anything like that. But Madeline McCann's parents, everybody thought they they had something to do with it when it first started. And mm -hmm. then when all this other stuff started coming out in the last couple of years that they might have a suspect in this, you know, and it's not a family member. And then it's like, oh, all the stuff that we thought looked so suspicious before. Right. You know, it's just anyway, so I don't know. Before you decide something, 
either way, like until you have evidence, there's no reason to think that he did anything. And this is a man whose child is missing. Right. And come on. I don't think that it's fair to because, I mean, we've talked about it before with almost damn near every case that we've covered. You I don't think anybody gets to have the right to tell you how your grieving process should go. Mm -hmm. So to say, well, he's not in front of the camera. So obviously he's not a good dad. Mm -hmm. Just because he doesn't show it and doesn't talk about it doesn't mean he's not going through it. Like some people just. And there's a big difference between him just not being the spokesperson, but being there. Yeah, because Scott Peterson trying to hide his face and telling people, don't take pictures if I'm around. And being on the phone the whole time. And, you know, now we know he was on the phone with his, you know, mistress, quote, mistress at the. Yeah. Like those are two very different things. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, too, because like it's not that John wasn't he was there. He was standing silently next to Colleen. You know, it's like. Mm hmm. And they still ripped him apart for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not unusual. Usually there is one kind of spokesperson for the family, somebody who's kind of taking charge. Like, yeah, to rip somebody apart for that was just awful. Mm -hmm. Four days after Morgan's disappearance, a home video was brought to the police department that had been shot at the ballpark the day of the disappearance. And in the background, there was a red truck with what appeared to be a white camper fitted incorrectly on the back. But some people said, I don't actually think that's a camper, camper top. It looks like maybe a storm door that he was like, this person was hauling and has turned it on its side to be there. So like from this angle, it looks like a camper, but it might just be a door. Um, So there was a lot of confusion about what it actually was. Um, police started collecting every home video they could, uh, from the Little League field, and they also collected videos from the rest of the complex, high school games, other Little League games. They found another video of a red truck with a white camper shell at a field on a different day, much like the one reported to have been seen on the night of Morgan's abduction. Police were unable to identify who that truck in the video belonged to or where it was. Locals in Alma and the surrounding areas were on the lookout for anything that might help investigators find Morgan or the man in the red truck. And one man who drove an early model red Ford pickup truck with a camper shell that was too long had been stopped so many times by the police that he wrote on the back of his truck with shoe polish, I haven't taken her. And he was like, not rude about, you know, he's like, they can stop me as many times as they want to. It's just, this is not the same truck. Like, you know, once they stop and talk to him and look through it, they realize it's not the same truck. It's just, it looks so much like it, which you wouldn't, I don't know, just, it seems like it would be very distinctive for it to be a red truck with a white top, because don't most people, I don't know, maybe not. I feel like, don't you usually get a camper top that, like, matches your truck? I've seen both, but. Yeah, just sometimes, sometimes not, but it's weird that it's a red with a white one he also like it it seems actually fairly common which i wouldn't have i I would have thought that would have been a factor that made it stand out right not necessarily though investigators had received several home videos from the game that night it seemed like all of them stopped right at home base and the truck was believed to be right past that so frustrating yeah um and police just panned just a little bit more just a little bit yeah and police felt completely helpless they felt like they were at a standstill uh nobody felt like they were any closer to finding morgan and months turned into years and the nick family was left wondering what happened to morgan who took her and if she was even still alive in 2019 the alma police department made an announcement after 24 years on the morgan nick case police chief russell white retired leaving the department and the now 24-year-old missing child case to Jeff Pointer. Newly appointed Chief Pointer immediately made contact with the Nick family. He told them that his plan was to go back and begin reviewing all of the information that had been gathered since day one. In 25 years, Morgan was the only missing child in the area that had not been located. He told them that there'd been over 8,300 leads in the case, most of which were dead ends. Chief Pointer discussed the different composite drawings of the suspected abductor. 
He also spoke about an attempted abduction at a nearby laundromat where the man hadn't been caught. In August of 90, 1997, investigators released a composite that was a hybrid of the one that Jessica and Ty had given, and then um, the the description of the one from the laundromat. Although some investigators had placed quite a bit of emphasis on the composites, Pointer said that he wasn't focused on those and that it was time to try something different. So Chief Pointer was ready to focus on facts, details, and specifics. So he and the rest of his team started to look at initial witness statements and facts. And the red truck had been parked next to Colleen when Morgan was abducted. And when Colleen and Morgan first pulled into that lot, they passed a few vehicles then they followed her friend to the far side of the lot where she had parked. She never recalled seeing the truck being there. And of course, like, you wouldn't, you know? You're not going to pull into a parking lot and be like, okay, there's this truck that, you know, like... Well, and I liked the way that... Because Chief Pointer, he was talking in the docuseries, and he was like, when you go to a parking lot, do you remember... Are you going to remember which cars are parked next to you? Are you no. going to remember uh, which cars passed you? Of course you're not. Mm -mm. Yeah. Like, yeah, even if you just think about, like, like yesterday when I went to pick my son up from his preschool, I parked, I got in a kind of a tight spot. Like, it's a really small lot. There's not that many spots. So I had to pull in between two cars, and I'm not a good driver. And so I pulled in, and I was, like, kind of crooked, and I was like, I should straighten this up. So I did the things to straighten it up. I'm still crooked as at the end of that. I don't know what I did. <laughs> you That's but, classic Torella. Exactly. Like, I, I'm like, did I do it? Am I doing it? Like, I don't know. But I couldn't tell you even the color of the car that I was parked next to on this side. This side, I know it was a white SUV. The only reason I know that is because when the woman came out with her daughter, I recognized that I know that mom and the kid or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, and I just felt bad because her daughter's side was the side that's closest to us but there wasn't enough room and it was a tight spot but um so she had to like get it on the other side or whatever so i texted her a little later and i was like i'm sorry i parked like an idiot or whatever so what i'm saying is i even had interaction with this i had reason to look at the cars next to me because i'm trying to make sure i'm not too close on either side of them mm -hmm. and i do i know that it was a white suv it was kind of a small suv but i could not tell you make model anything like that no recollection of the other car next to me. And and I have an anchor point, right? So we talk about this with eyewitness testimony. You need to have an anchor point of why you remember that thing. And like, I even have one of those. But her pulling into that parking lot, no reason she would remember any of that. Mm -mm. And, you know, I think that's another thing that's frustrating too, because you're like, gosh, if I could just if I could remember it or if I could think back. And it's like, but you ha just have no reason to pick up on that. Um, uh, you know, and I mean, most people don't remember seeing it. Uh, Jessica and Ty did see it because they had not necessarily an interaction with the man, but they, they picked up on it as they passed by. But even so, they said, you know, they thought that they'd seen the man sitting in the driver's seat of the truck smoking. There was a period of time where he'd kind of gotten out of the truck and sort of leaned on the hood. Um, but that's about it. And, you know, they couldn't even really, they weren't totally sure whether he was either just not wearing a shirt altogether or if his shirt was just like open in the front. They, they both definitely remembered seeing chest hair, mm -hmm. but not totally sure one way or the other, you know? Right. Um, and besides Jessica and Ty, nobody else reported having any type of contact with this mystery man in the red truck that night. Looking through crime scene photos, uh, Chief Pointer came across one of a red pickup truck with a white camper on it. After having just looked through past witness statements about the vehicle, he felt confident that he was looking at the truck in that photo at this point. Now, when they said that in the docuseries, I was like, yeah, I thought we knew that. Like, yeah. I thought we knew that. But what had happened in this investigation was in 1995, police had released that image of the red truck. And, you know, people were like people were stopping that one man over and over because it looked like the truck or whatever. 
Um, but at some point during an interview, a media interview, the former police chief had said, we've identified that truck and it's a Mazda and it belongs to a parent that was there that night. So it actually has nothing to do with this investigation, right? So that red truck off the radar. Nobody's looking for it anymore because they thought, oh, we figured out whose it was, right? Mm -hmm. When Chief Pointer goes back, he's like, okay, but where is that information in the investigation? Where's the report where you talked to him and you matched it up or whatever? Yeah. He can't find any documentation of that. And they asked the, the former police chief in the docuseries, um, who told you that that had been cleared? Because if he gave that to media, somebody would have told him that or he would have thought he read that somewhere or something, right? And he's just like, I don't remember anybody telling me that. I don't remember where it was. I, I, I think he even said he didn't remember saying it. Right. He definitely did. Yeah. He doesn't appear to be denying that he said it, but he's just like, I don't know where that came from. I don't remember where that came from, you know? It's and it it is it is frustrating because, you know, this is a child's life that's at stake. You want somebody to be damn sure before they say something like that in the public. Mm -hmm. But this far back, you know, and he doesn't remember who came to him and told him that. Right. I don't think it was malicious on his part in any way, shape or form. But it wasn't uh, thorough. Right. Definitely. Pointer took a step back and began making out different events that had happened throughout Alma on the night Morgan was abducted. He told her family that he didn't believe that she was the only circumstance that happened with that unidentified individual that night in Alma. The first encounter happened earlier in the evening. A local teenager um female was walking down the street when a truck drove past her then stopped it reverses back towards her and beside her with its passenger window slightly open and the man driving asked her if she would like a ride to downtown alma and this is the little league ballpark is in downtown alma the girl said no but the man did not move so she walks off and she left him sitting there in his truck and eventually he drives off creep yeah, what's really striking to me, too, because you're, you're going to hear seven different things that night, mm -hmm. including Morgan's possible interaction with this man. How do we not know who this man is? I know. I just looked it up. The population of Alma in 1995, according to the Goog machine, is 3,818. That's so, no bigger than your mom is Jack Russell. Exactly. How did nobody be like, oh, that's joe brown or you know like yeah or um wouldn't enough people be like and it's somebody i didn't recognize at all so i don't think he lived around here or right you know yeah i mean i guess if you're gonna abduct children you probably don't want to do it somewhere where where everybody's like hey joe how you doing how's your mom and them like you don't want to be totally recognizable but to have this many points of contact with this many different people that night and not one person either recognizes the truck, has seen him before. And I know most of the interactions are with teenagers or kids or whatever. It's just, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah. such a small town. And this is such a small baseball field mm -hmm. that, like, it just seems like you could sit everybody down and be like, tell me everybody that you know that you saw here. And we could start to paint a picture of every single person that's here and not one of them recognized him. I don't understand it. Not even a little bit, but let's get back to the other encounter. So yeah. the second encounter was more vague than the first. A woman called and reported that her two girls, five and six years old, had been playing out front by the street when they came running in towards her screaming. She looked up to see a red pickup truck with a white camper driving off. The third encounter was in downtown Alma a few teenage boys were walking home from the older kids baseball field a red truck with a white camper top stopped them or i guess it's just a camper i don't know why i said a top but stopped them it's a, top, it's a camper top oh, okay i was like that is that right are those real words okay so a red truck with a white camper stopped them and the driver a white male yelled at them for yelled yelled at them for walking in the road they watched as he turned onto Walnut Street, which leads straight into the upper parking lot of the Little League field. 
The fourth encounter was on Walnut Street. Another group of boys were riding their bikes in the street. A man in a vehicle with the same description stopped and yelled at them to get out of the road. He's very angry about anybody being in the in the road, apparently. Mm-hmm. The fifth encounter was with Morgan, Ty, and Jessica at the Little League Field. And the sixth encounter was a red truck being photographed on the street near the ball game. The last encounter was at an undisclosed location as police continued to investigate the area. Within a 10 minute period of Morgan being abducted, a group of teenagers who were driving in the undisclosed area saw a vehicle parked that matched the exact details of the truck in question, as well as a white male in the driver's seat. One of the teenagers in the truck even said that it appeared that the man in the driver's seat had been holding a child down in the front seat. When the group of teenagers learned about Morgan's abduction, they immediately reported what they'd seen to police. When they tried to lead them to the area, they were unable to due to the significant flooding. And listen, I mean, this, when we say significant, it's significant. I mean, some areas, they're fields, but they are in four feet of water. So. That are like far away mm -hmm. from the river. This is not like, here's the river and this is the field off the bank of it. It's like. There was a lot of flooding. A lot of standing water, yes. And the last location is the area that Pointer strongly believes is the last place that Morgan was after being abducted. He even speculates that she may um, have never even left the area. So one of the first main suspects in Morgan's abduction was a man named Charles Ray Vines. He was also known as the River Valley Killer. He raped and stabbed two elderly women to death in Texas. I'm sorry. In Arkansas. Where did you even get Texas? My brain said, bloop. <laughs> You're going to say Texas. I don't know what happened. I looked at Arkansas and said Texas. <laughs> um, excuse me. He raped and stabbed two elderly women to death in Arkansas in the 90s and was ultimately apprehended after being caught raping and attacking a 16-year-old girl. What a piece of crap, man. The investigators made a deal with Vines in order to question him on other unsolved cases because they strongly believed he had killed other people. There was jailhouse information as well that he had confessed to Morgan's abduction and murder. But by the time that they arranged to interview Vines, he was comatose with terminal cancer. And then he died not long after that. He never regained consciousness and was never able to be questioned. And of course, the police are skeptical of like a jailhouse tip essentially um but they did really want to at least question him and see if there was anything that they could get from that uh chief pointer said that he knew that vines had access to a red truck with a white camper but there wasn't a vehicle connected to him so it wasn't like registered in his name it's just he knew somebody who had one or something like that right but Vines had more than once remarked that the best place to hide a body was under concrete and rocks. So they actually brought excavation equipment and search dogs to his property to look for any sign of Morgan or remains, but none were ever found. Another individual that has been strongly in the forefront of suspects in Morgan's abduction is Billy Jack Lynx. In August of 1995, Lynx attempted to abduct an 11 year old from a Sonic in nearby Van Buren, just eight miles from where Morgan was taken and only two months after her disappearance. <sighs> curiouser and curiouser. Mm -hmm. I'm just about sick of people snatching children. Like, I can not understand it. And it's... Sometimes I understand why people can't listen to child cases because it makes you sad, of course, as it would. And... It makes you very mad. And the if I think about it too much, I think I am just want to, like, burn the whole world down to the ground. You know, like, I just want to, like, want a tirade, but. Yes, it's just, oh, my gosh. A girl was with her brother and a few of his friends at a Sonic when a white male in a red truck pulled up, started talking to him. They'd started walking away from the restaurant and he pulls up beside them. He was waving money at them, offering the boys money to go and get themselves a drink, but leave him and the girl there alone. Absolutely mm -mm. not. Absolutely mm -mm. not. And thank God they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, he started at that point being very vulgar and making sexual comments toward the girl, offering her money to come home with him. She's 11. 
disgusting. She said, yeah, it's horrific. She said no. She threatened to call the police. Good for her. Then he dropped a cigarette on the ground and asked her to pick it up and hand it to him. Nope. Thank God she did not do that. Mm -hmm. And Chief Pointer says that he would have grabbed her. That's that's what he was trying to do. Absolutely. You know? Get her close enough so he could grab her. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you something else I've heard um, that I would have totally fallen for, but this happened here recently. Um, and thank goodness the women just called police instead of stopping. But people will use, you know, things to get somebody to pull over or whatever. So, and I, we don't, I mean, I don't know that this is exactly what happened, but that's what it seemed like happened. But there were, it was late at night and um, off the side of the road, there was like what looked to be like a child walking on the side of the road. And so they called police instead of stopping and pulling over. And the police were like, don't stop. We'll go over there and we'll check, but you keep going. But it's like, you will see something on the side of the road or, you know, people will pretend to be that they're broken down or like whatever it is. And you pull over to help and then something happens. But it's like, this is what he's trying to do. He's appealing to that. Oh, I dropped that. Can you just help me out real quick? <laughs> I mean, Ted Bundy. And then, of course, that inspired Buffalo Bill. Mm hmm. Can you help me yeah. get this the, this couch in my van? Yep. Yeah. And like that, I don't know. That's just something like if I saw somebody on the side of the road and I thought like there was a kid or something, I would stop. Mm -hmm. Like, but yeah, now I know I've just to call it in. I've stopped for turtles. Pass, you know, like crossing the street. I'm like, let me help you out, little guy. Like, yeah, I will think twice now. Turtles will get you every time. I mean, they are notorious for nefarious yeah. things so exactly just kidding but um you know that's his that's what he's appealing to he's appealing to that um it's harmless just help me out here you hand it over yes yeah exactly you, i just dropped something you you can't just hand me something my gosh like whatever um so they ran they hightailed it out of there back to the sonic uh the man in the truck who the kids later reported to have seemed very intoxicated, sped off right into a pole and then fled in his vehicle. And the kids reported what had happened to the police. Another man called in to tell police that he saw a red truck's driver talking to a group of kids, and he thought it looked similar to the vehicle that was being looked for in regards to Morgan Nick's disappearance. So he wrote down the license plate number. My hero. Mm -hmm. Police found the vehicle registered to Lynx. Hmm. Okay. Mm. And uh, they went to his home. They found the described vehicle with the described damage. It all matches up. While Lynx was cooperative, he would not admit to the attempted abduction. He was arrested for sexual solicitation of a minor, and his vehicle was impounded and taken to be processed after the FBI was alerted by Van Buren police regarding the similarity to Morgan's case. So, things about Lynx and his vehicle started to line up with witnesses from Morgan's case. Jessica, Morgan's friend who'd been playing with her that night, didn't remember much about the man, but recalled that his truck seemed square with square lights. It looked like her family's Chevy pickup truck. Link's truck was a red 1986 Chevy. One of the kids in Alma who remembered being yelled at by a man in a red truck said that there was a dent on the front of the vehicle. Hmm. So as Chief Pointer continues to investigate into the impounding of Link's truck, while it was great that it had been sent to the crime processing lab, none of the evidence from 1995 from that arrest could be located. <gasps> Mm-hmm. Why? Why? This is just um, my absolute favorite. Every time, it's like, we've got it, or we had it, but now nobody knows. Nobody knows where it went. Yeah, it's gone. I don't know. Um, There were documents saying the vehicle had been processed, but no findings or evidence could ever be located. Meanwhile, Lynx passed a polygraph test, and many were convinced that he'd been cleared. He was sentenced to six years in prison in 1996 for the attempted kidnapping in Van Buren. That is not enough time. I was going to say, how is it? 
How is it only six years? Because again, attempted murder, attempted kidnapping, attempted whatever, it's that, it's kidnapping with a whoopsie. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If this whoopsie had not happened, I would have kidnapped a child. Yeah. So, and let, I mean, just look at this, though. If you are going to snatch somebody off the street, child, adult, whatever, abduction like this, mm-hmm. have we seen anybody? Um, I don't know. I would be interested to see the statistics. Is this a rehabilitation-friendly offense? Right. Is this something that gets better? Or when they get out of jail, do they go do it again and make sure they kill the person? Exactly. I'm going to guess that it's the latter. Um, Because I don't, I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen the numbers, but I can't imagine somebody trying it, not getting away with it, or not being successful at it, thank God, but then going to jail and then being like, you know what? I got that out of my system. Not going to do that again. No. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's sexually driven. Uh Uh-huh. You know? I just... Which, this guy links... He was making very vulgar and lewd remarks to an 11-year-old girl. Mm-hmm. So, and his conviction was solicitation of a minor. Yes! Sexual solicitation of a minor. That doesn't get better. No. That does not get better. In fact, it gets worse. Mm-hmm. And the only reason that he didn't get out and have the ability to do it again is because he died. Yeah. I mean, I just... um. <sighs> And he ended up dying in 2000 at the age of 76 while he was in prison. And that's before any of this stuff came up and that they went back, you know, and were linking him to this abduction. Um, Also, like, yes, linked links. Also, just in case you're wondering if he was brand new to crime when he attempted to solicit the 11 year old girl in Van Buren, he was not. Three years prior to Morgan's abduction, Lynx was accused of sexually assaulting his granddaughter. This was reported to police, but he never did serve any jail time for that. Because who cares, right? Why? Why mm. was this? Why was this man? I just okay. All right, we'll, we'll never know why. Because I'm we've disgusted. like yeah, we've talked about this with. I'm thinking Wesley Allen died. We've talked uh-huh. about this with a lo- with a lot of people. Um. I don't remember what we called this episode. It was episode number three, but it was like Path of a Serial Killer or something is what we did because we covered two people. I know what you're talking about, yeah. And one of them, Will, Bill Smith, William something Smith. I forget his, I forget his name now. It's been 200 Years. something episodes ago, yeah. Um, this is what he did. He abducted somebody on the side of the road, went to jail for that. She survived. He got out of jail, and then he picked up a little girl jogging and killed her. Mm-hmm. M- more than one, I believe. I might be confusing him with other people. But it's just like, Wesley Allen Dodd did that how many times? Like, it does not get better. What are we doing? No, and he, Wesley Allen Dodd was the definition, like the poster boy for slip through the cracks. Oh, gosh, yeah. And yeah. it nothing, I don't know if he attempted to be rehabilitated but he didn't he wasn't rehabilitated so no yeah not long ago investigators decided to run the vin number for link's old pickup truck and to their surprise the vehicle was listed as registered to someone the owner lived just 30 miles from alma he told investigators that he'd bought the vehicle at an auction for him and his three-year-old grandson to work on together one day the coloring was a little bit faded but there were obvious markers where there had been a camper shell and the holes had been filled. After the vehicle had been impounded following Link's arrest, it was sent to auction. They removed what they believed to be the original floor cover and found a singular blonde hair. So basically the vehicle was torn apart, everything was removed and sent to be processed. A few, uh, after a few months, results returned on the hair and a spot of blood found on the dashboard. While it was confirmed to be blood, there wasn't enough to develop DNA, and this is obviously disappointing for investigators, but obvi- not surprising. Because yeah. this is, I mean, 20 years, over 20 years later, um, the heat, the sunshine in the vehicle, it would make it really, really difficult to 
have a good sample of DNA after that. They waited for the last report of trace evidence to return and were shocked at what they found. Fibers were located under the seat, the driver's seat floor mat and carpet. Um, the metal padding and brackets that were a of a blue-green color. When police sent in quote-unquote known items for comparison with their evidence, they included a shirt that was the exact same type and from the same time frame as the blue-green Girl Scout t-shirt that Morgan was wearing on the night that she was abducted. The fibers in the truck matched microscopically and optically it, with the same characteristics to the one in the shirt, and it's highly unlikely that they'd match randomly with how many processes a t-shirt has to go through when it's being made. With the new discovery, Pointer and his team felt confident that while still being open to new discoveries, they could begin narrowing their focus towards one person of interest, and that is Billy Jack Lynx. Colleen Nick formed the Morgan Nick Foundation to provide support to families of all missing children. While the prospect of knowing what happened to her daughter is obviously something that Colleen hopes for, she also battles with the fact that if Lynx was responsible for her daughter's disappearance, she does not feel like Logan, Logan, excuse me, that Morgan will ever get justice. Morgan Nick is still currently listed as a missing person. Oh. She would be 34 today. She's a year younger than me. That's right. That's a sad one. That's tough. I mean, how many times, you know, do you let, like, I've let my kids, you know, when I'm thinking, like, when Ben has had soccer practice, um, at one of the fields that he had soccer practice at, there was this big sand pit that was like a beach volleyball kind of pit there or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and Jesse would want to go play with other kids while Ben's having soccer practice. And I'm like, okay, you know, we're it's a fairly small area. There's not a ton of people here. No, I don't know those other kids, but yeah, sure, you can go and, you know, you keep an eye out. Mm -hmm. mm. It's so scary. tragic. It is very, very scary. And it, it, obviously, it's important to talk about cases like this because you never know who knows something and maybe somebody will come forward and, you know, but it also puts the fear in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, see what yeah. can happen. Yep. Yeah, it's really scary. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. Um, oh, that's it. If you want, like, the whole deep dive, they also talk about in the docu-series another case that happened fairly Wisconsin nearby. Minnesota. Yeah, Jacob Wetterling. Mm -hmm. They're not really nearby, but they... Um, oh, they got to know each other. The moms. Because, yes. Um, oh. Gosh, get your tissues, though, because that, that thing, I just... Oh, yeah. Or get didn't. your punching bag, if you're like me. Yes, yeah, for sure. Because I had to... I had to hit my own self. Because I don't have a punching bag. And you weren't here, so... Yeah. Or else I would have kicked... you got to do what you got to do. I understand that. Kicked yeah. your ass. Exactly. Um, But we love you guys. We yes, will we see you next week. Yes, bye. Bye. Thank you.